Yeah, robots made of frog cells. Wow, exciting. We don't pay enough attention um, to biogenetics. Ethan Allen, our, our chief scientist, joins me here on Likeable Science uh, for the Think Tech 5 o'clock show on a given Tuesday. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm looking forward to learning more about, what do you call it, biogenetics, bio, bio, bio copying. Uh, Ethan, tell us what's going on. You know, we don't know enough about this. Sure, Jay. So uh, it's it's really a pretty intriguing stuff they've figured out. And they have just really started, this work is really pretty new. It started last year, they found if they take skin cells off of the embryos of this peculiar little frog scientists love called Xenopus larvus, uh, and that's why these are called Xenobots, um, Nothing fancy about the frog. Right, no. Garden but, variety frog. Well, it's, it's an African clawed frog, technically, but but yes, it's, it's been around for years and all. But they discovered that the skin cells of these embryos, if you sort of put them just in a dish by themselves, it's like they don't know they're supposed to be skin cells anymore. Uh, and they start like doing different things in, in different environments, and they'll start clumping together spontaneously, and they'll start working in a coordinated fashion when they've got some hundreds or thousands of cells gathered together into a little ball or and then what scientists discovered is they could they could actually take some heart muscle cells again embryonic heart muscle cells and stick them into the into the uh little cluster of cells and they actually build these things cell by cell by cell and stack them up in certain ways and the muscle cells allow it to contract and then it could start to move and it could move in organized fashions as they, all the cells would get together and they line up in certain ways and they can make coordinated movements. And so it, it's been very interesting and they'll start spontaneously doing things like gathering up other cells into piles together. No one exactly understands why they're doing this. There's no nervous system, there's no sense organs. These are just skin cells basically but they don't know their skin cells. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it shows the importance of context, right? Normal skin cells will be lying on a basal lamina or packed in with other skin cells in very organized fashions and getting signals telling them to behave like skin cells. These don't, and so they start doing other things. Um, and some of these things are pretty, pretty amazing, actually. <laughs> well, but we always knew that the DNA um, of a given organism is is found in any one cell. Am I right? Right. Uh, so that you know the idea is to take that one cell and make it into the whole organism. And now it looks like you know they've found at least some example of how that might work. It's pretty exciting. Yes, it, it's it's very intriguing. These these things uh, and there's. Uh, a great deal of potential down the road. This this is just real first steps. It was only last year they first built these things called Xenobots. And now they've actually refined them to where they're exciting just recently. They've built Xenobots that will reproduce themselves. But it's not like biological reproduction. That is, biological reproduction is either a cell splits into two half daughter cells, you know, doubles its chromosomes and splits in half, or they split into haploid cells and have so-called germ cells, sperm and egg, right? These xenobots, if you form them in a certain way, and they, they refer to it as a Pac-Man uh, formation, they then gather cells up, apparently using a little Pac-Man type opening. Pac-Man. Or form <laughs> these other cells into essentially into Pac-Man type shapes exactly like themselves. These go on to sort of grow up a little more, and they will then start gathering up cells and build more Pac-Man type shapes out of the cells that are around. So, so it's, it's not cells actually reproducing, it's cells actually building models of the same organism they are, if you call them an organism. It's sort of a question these, what these things really are. They're, they're very strange interfaces, not exactly life forms, not exactly machines. So oh, did, did the scientists have to do anything to make this, this robot come alive that way to activate the robot? Or did they just leave it sitting there? Um, apparently, they, it took a great deal of work. And this was the University of Vermont's Advanced Computational Center or something like that that, that figured this out. They 
had some sense that if they put a bunch of these cells together in certain forms, they could get them to start doing certain kinds of things. And so they literally did computer models of if you put a thousand cells together into a cube or a star shape or a line or whatever, what's going to happen? And they ran some computer models, fairly sophisticated computer models, and eventually settled on a smaller subset of cells of shapes that looked interesting and then began building these. And literally they, they would take individual cells and hold them with a, essentially a little pipette and move them around and stick them on other cells one by one by one. And so they actually would build these things out of a few thousand random cells, basically. And once they put them together in these shapes that had been predicted to do interesting things, they began doing interesting things. You know, they began moving around and moving around, not just like one of them, but if you put several of them together, they'd all move around in concert. And how they're doing this and why they're doing this is sort of a puzzlement. I mean, they have no sense organs. They have no neurons in there. How are they knowing what this other one is doing and how are they coordinating their actions? So the, the scientists had to put, put the cells together in a certain way. I mean, not just that they moved them around with pipettes, as you say, but they had to stack them in yeah. a certain way. And, and that may be critical to activating them as, as a robot. Exactly. Um, yeah, what, yeah. what was the what was the way? Do you know, you know, what was the architecture? Well, that's that's the one that they've gotten very excited about is this what they call Pac-Man because it's sort of it's a it's a a blob with a big wedge cut out of it basically, and that turned out to be for reasons that aren't clear uh, a very active thing where it will use that wedge that's cut out of it to apparently gather more cells together and then it somehow knows how to build itself. So out of these other cells, it builds a, 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 something very much like itself that then goes off on its own and you know, finds yet more cells and builds. So you, you've, they've done this multiple generations now. So these things are, are great. I mean, that they're, so unlike machines, one, they heal themselves uh, like life forms do. You, know, you can actually injure them and they will actually regenerate the tissue. Two, they're, they're obviously completely biodegradable. They're tissue, you know, they're, they're you know, biological tissue. They're not, not machines, so they're not going to pollute anything. They don't need an outside energy source, particularly other than whatever they're getting out of their local environment in terms of chemicals and all. Um, you have to feed them? I would guess their, their environment must contain stuff that, that they use, you know, the right balance of ions of various types and probably some some sort of precursor molecules to enable them to keep keep their metabolism going and keep building cell parts and repairing themselves. Um, you, you, know, you probably couldn't just stick them in distilled water and expect they'd work very long. Yeah. But, is this uh, all at the microscopic level? You, you couldn't see this uh, with the naked eye? The, the, I guess once they build them with a few thousand cells, you know, they're you know, less than pinhead size and maybe a millimeter uh, or a fraction of a millimeter. So you can just barely see them, apparently. Uh, they're, they're up at about that scale, right down magnifying glass to microscope level, you know. This is fascinating. You know, uh, I mean, I, I just, you know, maybe it's a statement of the methodology, but so I'm a scientist. I'm a biological scientist. I like microscopes and things. I, I like to operate at the cellular level rather than the atomic level, I suppose. Um, and I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and I say, hmm, frogs, we have to do this with frogs, frog cells. I mean, how could they have made that choice? I mean, there were a lot of other organisms in the world that they might have chosen at two in the morning. Why frogs? Xenopus <laughs> uh, has been a very favorite uh, so-called prep, uh, an animal that has been widely used by a lot of biological scientists for years, particularly in developmental studies. So they have studied how Xenopus eggs and sperm come together and fuse into a little zygote and, and build, build itself up and grow and, and two cells become four cells, four become eight, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they followed this for many, many decades. Uh, I mean, they were working on Xenopus when I was in graduate school. It was, it was not a new prep at that point. So, um, so it's well established, it's developmental thing, it's developmental characteristics. So they knew that 
the properties of the cells and what they would do depend upon where they find themselves uh, and what, who their neighbors are and what their environment is. And so it wasn't really a big leap in some sense. I mean, somebody obviously was pretty, pretty bright to figure this out, but uh, to think, gee, maybe if we put a few hundred of these cells together in an interesting conformation, maybe they'll do something interesting. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. And, and as I say, they, they apparently ran a computer models to figure out what might be interesting, you know, conformations to build given a few hundred to a few thousand cells and tried literally apparently hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these potential shapes and then selected the best few um, that, that for different things. Um, yeah, well, well, what I get out of that is <clears throat> the reason they went to frogs is because they've been working with frogs for a long time. If they had been working with some other organism, they might have used that organism. Um, so the, I guess the question I would put is, it, is, is a frog, is a frog cell, is the, the biology of frogs, the chemistry of frogs different than, you know, what, why is a frog different from all other things? that make it special for this. And I and I get the answer as well, because we've been working with it, because we're familiar with frogs. We know what we have, how you have to handle frogs. We know how to, you know, provide nourishment or whatever you need for an environment for so frog cells can grow. But if we had known, um, you know, I don't know, caterpillars just as well, we might have tried caterpillars for the same experiment. I would be willing to bet dollars to donuts at this point that are already trying well, probably with mouse cells now uh and probably take embryonic mouse cells because they, again they've pretty well established what, what environment they need and they're probably you know trying to pull groups of mouse cells individual mouse skin cells together maybe with some heart cells uh stuck into into it and build them into certain configurations there's no real fundamental reason it shouldn't work just as well in a mouse or a person as in a frog. Um, yeah, I thought you said person there for a minute, Ethan. Uh, no, you no, said person, did a human being person. Yeah, you, you could take embryonic human cells and presumably just again, we're not that, we're not that special, you know. Yeah, <laughs> animals just like everyone else, you know. Well, let's make a wild assumption and assume that the same process could be achieved. Maybe you'd have to, you know, tune up the um, the environment for the growth environment for the cells and the way you handle them. But let's assume that you could achieve the same process, not only for mice but for human skin cells. Um, let's assume that. What what do we learn from all this? What do we learn about cellular biology? What do we learn about biochemistry on the microscopic level? What do we learn about life? Well, it, it, I mean, it tells you very interesting things about uh, some of the factors that control uh, function. So it's, it, it is indeed a classic case of, of you know, form yielding function. Uh, literally, in this case, they build certain forms and get certain functions out. Um, but what they get out of it really is it should be possible eventually, for instance, if these things will go around and gather up selected objects in their environment. For instance, you could envision putting these in your uh, bloodstream and having them go around and gather up atherosclerotic plaques out of your uh, arteries and chew them up and digest them away for you. Just uh, like a little Pac-Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know or uh, you know, set, set them loose in uh, the environment and they, if you have some that were essentially trained or programmed to go after microplastics. They could perhaps bring all the little bits of microplastics together and form them into some little macroplastic conglomeration. Did you say trained or programmed? Yes. Well, yes. Is, is there a suggestion from where we are now to training or programming a frog, frog skin cell to do a, a somersaults, for example? Yeah. Uh, that's, I mean, that's very much that is these different shapes they built did different things. Uh, some were more or less just big spheres, and they apparently run around and will gather other cells together in, in mounds in their environment, but they won't reproduce themselves. They, after a week or two weeks, they just die. 
Um, this, this peculiar Pachmion shape they, they developed is the first one now that reproduces itself. So that, that was very exciting to them because you know that sort of says you can build something that can last and can go not only do a task, but then it can build its next generation of beings to go on and continue that task. So um, the potential for doing a lot of useful work suddenly has expanded immensely, you know? It's, it's mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a vision of Star Trek, you know, how they could heal anything wrong with you. And it wouldn't necessarily be, mm, you know, working on the skin or in the body. It would be taking the cells from the body and putting them in this this auger dish somehow and letting them develop and then as you say programming them training them tuning them up so that they achieve a certain purpose um maybe healing and then you put that cell from the auger plate back into the body and it does its job sort of like that book years ago a fantastic journey was it along mm -hmm. those lines those microscopic healing things Right. Um, what's your reaction? <laughs> Absolutely. There's no reason, for instance, and again, we're just speculating wildly here, uh, but if you could, for instance, train uh, little xenobots, except these might be human bots, instead to uh, go after certain uh, tumor cells, recognize and, and glom onto and kill off tumor cells, you could use them to, to get rid of tumors in the body, and they might do so very, very efficiently. Um, you could use them, yes, in wound healing conceivably. Um, uh, there might be ways to do all, uh, you know, all kinds of things. One, one can speculate wildly. You could, you could go off and they could circulate in the brain and re remove uh, uh, tangles and, and plaques in the brain and help actually reverse Alzheimer's ultimately. You know, and there, there's really, if you start speculating that there is no end to how useful they could be. Um, well, I, you know, and to get to that level seems to me um, that we're going to have to know more about the um, atomic level, the molecular level of the frog cell that, that's reproducing this way or whatever, whether it's the mouse, the human. We're going to have to look deeply into that cell to see the mechanics and how exactly that works. You know, there's a researcher in the Cancer Research Institute. His first name is Clarence. He's a, a Clarence Naguma, or a, a name like that. He's been on our shows. I want to get him on again. Um, he's been doing AIDS research, and he looks into that, and he can give you charts, an electronic microscope, um, you know, graph graphics of exactly what's going on in a given cell at the molecular level. And I think that um, it sounds like this research is not really yet at the molecular level. I would want to know how the, mole the molecules interact and activate each other in order to achieve, you know, the reproduction. Um, what, what do you, what's your reaction to that? Yes, uh, I think one of the next things that will happen, and you and I have talked about CRISPR technology, where uh, you can go in and essentially manipulate DNA now with some reasonable degree of precision, cutting out bits you don't want and inserting bits you do want. Uh, I suspect that's going to get combined with this technology and that they'll uh, take the embryonic cells, run some CRISPR alteration on them and insert DNA sequences that they know generate, for instance, generate more cilia, let's say, more of the little protrusions from cells, and then put a bunch of those things together and they'll have a highly ciliated little xenobot or whatever, uh, which probably could do different kinds of things than one without cilia. Um, cilia turn out to have a lot of interesting properties. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely, they're, they're going to, I'm sure they're looking at, at sort of why these behave the way they do. A lot of it apparently actually has to do with sort of the biophysics that is actually the, the, the structure of the cell and how that structure is determined by its neighbors, its environment, you know, the, the chemistry uh, of, of its, of its local, local neighborhood as it were, almost. Well, you know, this is um, pretty interesting because it's, it's sort of, it's a parallel to CRISPR. It's apparel to do the, the remarkable things at the molecular level, um, or even you know smaller than that, 
um, at the table of um, the table of elements, if you will, and how the atomic elements connect with each other. Then all these things are like we find out about them, and we and they run parallels. Um, but when we figure out how to connect these disciplines and these, um, you know, laboratory. Um, I don't want to say tricks, but these lab laboratory procedures to implement one procedure and another procedure, have them both at the same time, connect them up. Um, then, God, the, you know, the, the, the possibilities are unimaginable. And so I wanted to ask you about that. So, okay, I, I mean, I'm thinking fictionally of, um, of uh, Star Trek. Um, you know, I'm thinking fictionally of a uh, fantastic journey, a voyage, whatever that book was called. Um, but I don't think we're that far from it. I mean, for example, we had a show not too long ago by a woman who wrote a book on, on COVID. And uh, her, her really remarkable um, aspiration was that one of these days, we're not only going to figure out how to deal with, um, you know, the viral particles that make up COVID, but we're going to be able to anticipate their mutations, their variants. Mm -hmm. We're going to be able to determine how they will mutate in the future and head them off um, because we will know the process of mutation and therefore we'll be able to deal with anything they can come up with. Now that will change life on this planet. I'm not sure exactly how, but it will change life on the planet. Now, if we could get these Pac-Man things, okay, to go after uh, virus particles, uh, anticipate them, train the Pac-Man robots, not from frogs, but human cells, uh, to go after antigens of one kind or another, we could attack all kinds of things that are happening at all kinds of levels in the body. I mean, it's the fountain of youth. Uh, it's... it's um, uh, beyond imagination. You could, I, I, you know, I don't think you actually need to use the, this whole xenobot technology in a sense, though, because once we begin to understand sort of how how that mutation is happening and can anticipate it, then using something like CRISPR, you can go in and just hit your own immune cell, immune system cells, and plug in the right DNA so that they will already be sort of primed and ready and expecting. Uh, that is sort of almost like they've been vaccinated uh, for this new variant that they've never seen. Um, so yeah, uh, fascinating stuff. But to your point that, you know, that bringing these dis different disciplines together is, is very interesting. That's certainly proven true, you know, in the past, say, five or six decades of science. You, you see much of the really interesting work is happening at interfaces between traditional branches of science, between biology and physics, as the xenobots are, uh, between chemistry and engineering. You know, these fields like chemical engineering now are very popular, very productive fields. People are developing really interesting stuff, uh, you know, through them. And I know you shared some very interesting articles with, with me on some of the bioengineering stuff, uh, that, that some of the, the uh, research groups in Israel have been doing. So um, yeah, it's it's where a lot of the action is these days is at the interface of, of, of traditional fields. Yeah, well, you know, all of this raises, when you talk about xenobots, uh, about living, you know, for living cells, um, and these uh, uh, really fantastic intelligences that we find in living cells that we never, we never fully understood, we never knew that they were there, that they could behave this way. Um, you know, it, it does suggest that we step into a godlike role of being able to change living mm, organisms, um, build them, uh, create them. I mean, it's it's almost it violates um, our notion of where where man ends and or humans end and God begins. Uh, we can we can create organisms that you know, that we've never seen before, or recreate them. We can we can create organisms, for example, that are extinct. We can make them happen yet again. We can build a whole new world for this, and that suggests. And we have four minutes to do this. That suggests the the ethical considerations 
that are right out there and that scientists have to study at the same time. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, exactly. There was the uh, Japanese or Chinese scientist a little bit ago who did some genetic engineering on human embryos and was has been widely criticized for that, basically. Uh, the rest of the community feels very much that's not an ethical thing to do. Uh, we aren't, we don't know enough. He's, he's screwing around with stuff that, that we don't really understand well enough to be screwing around with. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a whole, it's a big issue in a lot of sciences. Uh, the, the whole thing with climate change now, people are looking at geoengineering, right? Uh, ways the to- The Chinese are. Oh, yeah. They're definitely looking at that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everyone's looking at it actually. And again, there's all kinds of ethical considerations because when you pile stuff out in the atmosphere to make your place a little cooler, what are you doing? Up, you know, that stuff that you've put in the atmosphere goes around and around and it's pretty soon everywhere in the world and it's affecting your neighbors in the Arctic and the equatorial regions. And so, yeah, I mean, those ethical considerations that you mentioned are uh, increasingly large, I think, in scientists' minds. I think people worry about um, the science fiction movies and the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the valley of the, the walking dead, that sort of thing. These aberrational organisms that might be people or were people. I mean, it's, it's out of science fiction and, and it's out of scary science fiction. And I, I think that's what scares people about not wanting to go there. But, you know, you imply by your answer, Ethan, um, that there will come a time, perhaps, when we understand the connection, the connection with, with these uh, xenobots and with bio, biological processes in general and, and uh, um, uh, CRISPR and, um, you know, this molecular biology that the uh, Cancer Research Center is working on um, and atomic um, atomic um, uh, understanding of the atomic interactions. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this is right out there. We, we know the disciplines. We just haven't put them together yet. Something mm -hmm. like that. And we're, we're, you know, University of Vermont does this. Well, what about the University of New Hampshire? They do that. They may not talk to each other enough. If they talk to each other, maybe there's something come out of it. But the problem is, um, is this. How much this you, you're going to hate this question? <laughs> How much do we have to know about this before we can get comfortable about doing clone work or manipulation of human cells and tissues and bodies? Uh, where is the point of comfort there? Um, do you see where that would be? How what would be the standard before we could go there? Um, well, they ran into this when the, the whole issue back in the 1970s of recombinant DNA first came up, and they realized this is a potentially life-altering uh, life technology, and actually had a, 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 they called a big conference, and it wasn't just with scientists. They had uh, theologians, philosophers, uh, government people, uh, all kinds of people there to, to, to hash things out and say, hey, look, look at what's happening here. Look at the doors this is opening. How do we deal with this? What do we, what do we say is basically, you know, our standards? What are we going to say is okay? You can do this experiment. No, you can't do this sort of experiment. And I mean, it's it's yeah, you've got to hash these things out because, of course, as we know, as we know more, we keep opening up doors on what we don't know, right? Which is always larger. You know, there's always more that we don't know out there. So, you know, we're never going to get to a point where we say, hey, we really we got this one. We know it all now. If you get to that point. You know, you're, you're, you're fooling yourself. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it suggests two things to me. Uh, one is that maybe there has to be some international regulation of this, um, uh, sort of threshold, threshold standards, so we don't go to places which are too scary to a panel of scientists that has looked into the ethical hyphen science issues. That's one thing. But the other thing, you know, not that it's settled, but uh, there are those even still today who believe uh, that the Wuhan laboratory was actually weaponizing virus, um, not necessarily limited to COVID-19, but uh, other viruses that could be weaponized. And I mean, and that's a logical possibility, of course. But everything you and I have talked about in this half hour could likewise be weaponized. Oh, yes. And God knows, and I'm using that term advisedly. God knows what that could what that could do to humanity. Oh, what are yes. your thoughts? 
there, there are big groups uh, talking and uh, debating on this dual use technologies and how do we how do we control that when you have a technology that, for instance, you, you make take a, a deadly disease and make it more transmissible now, more easily transmissible. That's like, eh, is that okay to do? I mean, maybe you've learned something about transmissibility and all, but you've also potentially then you've made a you've made a nasty weapon, weaponizable thing at least, um, if not a, an actual weapon. You know, and, and yeah, large debates happen about this kind of work, and, and it's a good thing. It needs to happen. The discussions need to be taking place. You can't have people just working on these areas by themselves without talking to others because they'll go right ahead and do that. They'll go right ahead and take that next step without thinking, you know, without considering all the ramifications. They'll just see their little narrow piece of it, like, oh, this is going to make this piece better. It's going to make me famous and blah, 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 and not considering. Yeah, what if you let the xenobots loose in the world and they start reproducing and reproducing like like the tribbles in Star Trek, right? <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm thinking of um, um, I'm thinking of the boys from Brazil, where uh, I mean this is all fiction, but uh, what is fiction today is fact tomorrow. Right. Um, I'm thinking of the boys from Brazil, where a bunch of scientists decided they would make a, a generation of Hitlers. Mm -hmm. And they create that biologically. And we, we don't need a generation of Hitlers. Right. Um, I'm thinking of the clay soldiers in Xi'an, China, mm -hmm. uh, which were, you know, a clay, of course, but you could build a soldier that would be um, a stronger than the other guy's soldier. And before you know it, you could, you could have a very in, indefatigable uh, group of soldiers. Mm -hmm. You could build people that are very smart. Um, you could change humanity by changing the groups that would predominate. Um, this is pretty scary stuff. I, I prefer the natural myself, however flawed that might be, natural Mendelian you know, <laughs> selection. <laughs> but I mean, it's irresistible for a scientist who may not be um, so much interested in the ethical aspects of it, and he, you know, he could be working in in a, in a laboratory in in, in uh, the the Ural Mountains and uh, <laughs> invent these things, and then pop up with a weaponized uh, technique that would change the world. Uh, and so it's hard actually to stop it because that scientist in the mountains can read the material from all the other scientists and not share his work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, every scientist should be trained in ethics. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then more and more of them are getting that way. But but absolutely, uh, you're quite right that that should and must be a requirement in, in science to, to understand the ethical implications of, of your work. You know? Yeah. No. So what's your sense of the horizon on this? You know, we you and I have talked about this kind of thing, uh, you know, uh, from one show and then another show and um, it, it all kind of comes together is that biology is moving very quickly. Um, microbiology is doing things every time you look that are more remarkable. Um, when are we going to see some changes that are, what do you say, you know, life changing? <laughs> That's the wrong word, isn't it? Life changing. When are we going to see that happen? Well, I mean, arguably we've, we've seen some of those. I mean, our, our lives are, much different if you think about how you spent your time during COVID than how you would have 10 years before that, 15 years before that, in terms of the, the internet and the cell phones and all your communication devices and the way you and I are, are running the show right now. Uh, you know, it, it's already changed big aspects of our lives. Uh, the, the whole world of commuting for work is probably never going to be the same. I mean, yeah, and, and biology is, you know, sort of right behind that. Um, I mean, they're, they're already, you know, working on, they have a, a new uh, vaccine for malaria now, you know, that's remarkable news and is going to, you know, likely going to save hundreds of thousands of lives per year. Um, so there are, you know, changing people's lives in a big way, right? Uh, families won't lose children. So uh, it's, it's a, you know, I'm fundamentally an optimist. I, I think science, scientists in general are pretty good people. I, I hope enough of them are ethical enough to realize the, the implications of their work. Um, and I believe that they are. Uh, they, they've shown a good deal of willingness to step up and say, hey, let's let's put a little pause on this and talk about it before we sort of run down that alley. Um, and 
it's going to move on. It's going to move on. Science never stands still, you know. And the question is, yeah, can we keep it in sync with with our ethics and our humanity? You know, it's biblical, Ethan. What I mean is, uh, let's assume for a moment for this discussion that there is a God, and the God gave humanity, you know, the skills to look deeply into our world, including the natural world in the planet, you know, vis-a-vis -vis climate change. Um, but what we haven't understood until now is that we not only have the ability to look and improve, we have the ability profoundly to change things, to change our own species, our, our own natural biology. Our, I mean, the physical planet, the physical condition of humanity, we now can change it. And that's the biblical test uh, you know, beyond anything we expected before. And you and I live in that time. We live in that time. And I suppose from an observer's point of view, a journalist's point of view, you know, we are very, we should be very happy that we can observe and see this and participate and have this conversation together. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I feel tru truly lucky indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Let's do it again soon. Ethan yeah. Allen, our chief scientist, who, who takes us far and wide around the universe, from the planets and the stars, right down to the microbiology in our skin. Thank you, Ethan. You're welcome, Jake. Aloha. Aloha.